last 50 years, we have made these extraordinary discoveries that change the world. I'll guarantee you, we will never make that next discovery if we don't keep exploring. Final visit to enhance the vision of Space exploration raises what we believe we can accomplish. It brings out the best in us, and it is an extraordinary value. Tonight we're celebrating 50 years of solar system exploration. Uh, when, I, when I was a kid, the uh, Mariner 2 spacecraft flew by Venus, and the big discovery was, for me, that astonished me, Venus turns the wrong way. And then you ask yourself, well, what does that mean, the wrong way? Who gets to say what's right? And that right there, I remember that moment where you, you get to question things. It's OK to, uh, to change what you expected with, uh, with the facts. And this is what I find so compelling. Space exploration brings out the best in us. It brings out the best in people. And as Carl Sagan used to say, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. And we have here tonight the people that created that legacy. And I believe we have here in the room the people that will carry it on. Thank you, Bill. Well, you know, 50 years ago, little Mar Mar Mariner 2 started on a, its historic journey to Venus uh, in August of 1962. And it was a 100-day mission to get to Venus. And it made it just barely. It had three weeks to spare and established, really, the beginning of a new age of exploration, which is what we're going to be talking about tonight and which you all read about in your textbook uh, every year when you, when you study the planets. It's interesting that just three years after that historic flyby, a graduate student at Caltech named Gary Flandreau was studying the orbits of planets at JPL and discovered that every 176 years, all four of the giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, are lined up so a single spacecraft can fly by. So you're saying that? Once every 176 years. So who was it? Be, um, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. Right. He had the planets lined up. And he missed. Didn't do anything about <laughs> Didn't it? Didn't do it. <laughs> But it was a big challenge. You can see, it was, it, remember, 100 days to Venus. To get to Neptune was 12 years. And Neptune is 30 times as far from the sun as the Earth. So the sunlight is much, much dimmer out there. So those are some of the challenges. But JPL designed a spacecraft called Voyager. It was launched, uh, we started on in 1972, 40 years ago. It was Two of them were launched in 1977. But Mariner 2, on its way to Venus, it also found, for the first time, measured directly the fact that from the sun, there's a million mile per hour wind blowing radially outward, creating a huge bubble around the sun called the heliosphere. And today, the two Voyagers are on the journey to interstellar space to leave the bubble. Today, Voyager 1 is 11 billion miles from Earth. 122 astronomical units from the sun. It is very near the edge of interstellar space and will soon become our first interstellar probe, observing and being immersed in material that has come from other stars than our own sun. So that's just part of the legacy from the many missions, which in fact have changed our view of the solar system, and in fact, which will continue to be changed by the missions currently underway and those which you will all be hopefully working on and enjoying some decades in the future. Space exploration is humbling. We think we have this, we think we're the big deal being yeah. on Earth, but we're pretty small compared to these other worlds, yet we can understand it. And I find that so compelling. I find that just brings out the best in us. So to understand these other worlds <laughs> along this line. Margie, you were a physicist. You got interested in a magnetic field. That's right. Um, well, I, I would say that my first thoughts of space came a, a month and a day after my daughter was born when I stood in the garden and watched Sputnik go overhead. <laughs> and at that time, I certainly wouldn't have said that 50 years later, well, little more than 50 years later, there'd be an armada of spacecraft that had uh, visited all the planets of the solar system on the way to the edge of interstellar space. Uh, but that did get me excited. Uh, I then worked with a student who had been given a very interesting problem. 
uh, the moon Io, the volcanic moon, seemed to control the intensity of radio emissions from Jupiter. As it went around its orbit, at certain points of its orbit, the radio emissions became more intense. And nobody could figure out why, although they figured there must be some electrical currents connecting Io with the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. So Io was really a strange and important object, but it's only one of the moons of Jupiter. I got really interested in Jupiter and its moons and had the audacity to uh, try to become the, to provide an instrument, a magnetometer to measure the magnetic field of Jupiter and maybe see what was going on around the moons. So I proposed for what was called Jupiter Orbiter Probe. It later became Galileo, and I got the chance to do it. And there is the Galileo spacecraft in the high bay at Jet Propulsion Lab. And what you ought to look at first is the antenna, because that's an important part of the story. You can see it's very, very large, comparing it with the size of the people who are standing around. There's a boom sticking out, and there are two magnetometers on it. And the reason we put the magnetometer on a boom is that we wanted to measure the field of space, not the field of the spacecraft. Uh, and we had to get far away so we wouldn't do that. Um, uh, then we had a lot of trouble uh, between the times that we started building this mission and the final successful launch, but we were finally launched in 1989. You can see I was very happy about it. <laughs> and so were a lot of other people. <laughs> It took us six years to get to Jupiter because of a sort of an underpowered space interplanetary engine. But after we'd been out for a couple of years, uh, we, uh, time came to deploy the big antenna. Uh, the antenna had been launched, folded up like an umbrella. They tried to open the umbrella, the umbrella stuck, and that was a very, <laughs> serious moment. Uh, but uh, there was a small antenna that we'd been using for a couple of years. And so instead of having the spacecraft send long email messages, it sent us tweets. <laughs> and you know, when you have a tweet, it means that you get the most important information in the fewest words. And that's what Galileo did for the six years that it was in orbit around Jupiter. That and, is extraordinary. Yeah. And as we say, nicely done. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Kevin, along with being uh, deputy scientist for solar system exploration, in 2011, you were, you were an emerging explorer at the National Geographic Society. And you explore these distant, watery worlds. Now, before I talk about the search for life elsewhere and, and, and these potentially habitable worlds in the outer solar system, I want to connect us back to our understanding of life here on Earth. Um, the past 50 years have really seen a revolution in our understanding of, of, of what makes life tick and, and, and how life on Earth works and, and where on Earth life can survive. Keep in mind that it was just 1953, about 60 years ago, when the structure of DNA was revealed. It was 1977 when the first method for sequ sequ <laughs> sequencing DNA was published. And, and for any of you that are involved with National Geographic's Genographic Project and, and Spencer Wells and, and, and the fantastic team that's working on that, everything that the Genographic Project is based on starts with that DNA sequencing method. That's 1977. Now also in that year, explorers of our ocean depths, including National Geographic's Bob Ballard, discovered these hydrothermal vents at the bottom of our ocean. These are hot springs, basically, on the seafloor, cut off from the sunlight, down there four kilometers at depth. 
No sunlight, incredible pressure, quite cold. And yet what they found was that life doesn't just exist at these hydrothermal vents. Life thrives. You can see in some of this video that there are microbes around the chimneys. You see the whites and the, the, the yellows and stuff. Those are all microbes. There's a little crab. A little crab. <laughs> So uh, unlike life at the surface of the Earth, where the base of the food chain is photosynthesis, at the ocean's depths and in many of the extreme environments here on Earth where, where life uh, thrives, it's the base of the food chain is, is utilizing chemosynthesis, use, utilizing the chemistry, in this case, of the hydrothermal vent fluids. And so the microbes are using that, and then the, the crabs and the fish and the shrimp and uh, the clams and everything else are building off of that, that food chain. Now, so the exploration of our own planet has really expanded our understanding of what it takes for a world to be habitable. And in the early days of solar system exploration, we had this kind of uh, Goldilocks scenario where in order for a world like the Earth to be habitable, you had to be at just the right distance from your parent star, such that liquid water would be stable on the surface and in contact with a, a nice atmosphere, and you could have continents and clouds and all sorts of wonderful stuff. If you were too close to your parent star, like Venus, then you were too hot. If you were too far away, like Mars, then you were too cold. This was sort of the Goldilocks scenario. But our exploration of the solar system has really changed that. This is outdated. This is sort of an old Goldilocks. Mm -hmm. We now have a new Goldilocks scenario. It's a scenario of habitability that's mediated not by distance from your parent star, but instead by tidal energy dissipation, the tug and pull of a world like Europa or Io with its parent planet. We've got Europa and Ganymede, and these worlds may occupy this kind of new Goldilocks zone. And Europa in particular may have this global subsurface liquid water ocean of some 100 kilometers in depth. This is a liquid water ocean. And when I say that, I mean H2O, good old fashioned liquid water. So bear in mind, everybody looked at Jupiter with a telescope and you've seen the Galilean moons. You're looking at these moons. Yeah. And you're telling me that when I'm looking at that little pinprick of light, I'm looking at 100, I'm looking at 70 miles of water. Yes. You do the math, it turns out that Europa harbors two to three times the volume of all the liquid water found here on Earth. That is wow. a tremendous volume of liquid water. And for a planetary scientist, an astrobiologist like myself, liquid water, that is the, the, the flag waving for Come here, look for life. We've got liquid water. So Europa has this liquid water ocean, and we think it's got a rocky seafloor that might be home to hydrothermal vents, to some of the, the kind of similar geological activity that we see at the depths of our ocean here on Earth. And Europa, Ganymede, Callisto, these are, are, are just a few of what I would call the ocean worlds of the outer solar system. Incredibly compelling places to go and search for life beyond Earth. Where did we come from? And are we alone? And if you want to answer those two questions, you have to explore space. And that's what Dr. Hand was talking about especially. But right now, while we're sitting here, we are exploring the next logical place to look for signs of life, a, a, an answer to the question, are we alone? And someone who's working on that diligently right now is Dr. Elman. Bethany, you are working on the Curiosity rover. You are a participating scientist. And you're going to take us to Mars. I'm going to take you to Mars, but I'm going to take you to Mars by way of this particular iconic photo, which a lot of you in the room probably recognize. I think, I think it did a number of things. I think it showed how we are all together here on one planet. We better figure out how to get along on it, how to take care of it. It's hanging here in the void of space. And we can look at it from the closest nearby planetary body, the moon, but you see the craters and the lifeless surface. It can't sustain life. The Earth, though, there hangs delicately 
in the horizon? And that's the question that drove me to space exploration. How do planets sustain life through time? Why are some planets able to host life? Others don't. I think one of the messages from this, this glorious 50 years of solar system exploration has been the diversity of worlds that are out there to be explored. We have, we have, we have worlds with, with a deep ocean, and we have worlds where I'll take you now to Mars where, that are very much on the edge. So we know from our explorations here of life on Earth that everywhere there's water, there's life. You know, deep underground, two kilometers underground and are in the deepest mines, deep in hydrothermal vents at the ocean floor, inside volcanoes, inside nuclear reactors. Wherever there is water, there is life. So Mars is the closest to being like Earth in our solar system. Today it, it's cold, it's dry. If there is liquid water on the surface, it's very ephemeral. But that raises the question, was there life? Is there life? And so that's what's driven the exploration of this, our neighbor and fourth planet out from the sun. So in addition to rovers, studies on Earth, one of the other tremendous uh, aspects of looking at it, Mars is the flotilla of orbiters that we have around Mars. And the resolution has been getting better and better and better. So as we've gotten the capability to peer at Mars at higher and higher resolution, what's become apparent is that Mars hosted hydrothermal systems in the past. It hosted lakes. It hosted environments where soils were forming. Some of them were acidic. Some of them were alkaline. The further we look back in Mars history, the more it looks like Earth. And the first billion years of Mars's history, the period from three and a half billion years ago backward, Mars looked quite a bit like Earth at that time. So that raises the question, was there life? Could there have been life? How do we find it? So we're taking steps in that direction now, both from orbit and from, from the rovers. I have the privilege of working on the team that day to day, working together, scientists and engineers, sets the activities of the rover. We get the data down from Mars. We have the period of the Mars overnight to work to put together the plan, the entire 24 hours, 40 minutes of activity on Mars so that by the time the rover wakes up at 9.45 a.m. the next morning, it sleeps late, but then it looks to Earth to get its command load. We send it down and then it, it executes it on its own. It's, it's autonomous in that sense. And we move further and further to being able to do higher fidelity laboratory experiments for the, the robots that we send outward in the solar system to be sophisticated explorers in our own right. And you know, these explorers, this is a self-portrait of the rover taken with a microscopic imager, turned backwards <laughs> before the dust cover was off to get this artistic effect. But as this rover peers out into the surface, it is a proxy for us standing on the surface of Mars and peering outward onto the surface. How many people would go to Mars? <laughs> <laughs> there you go, look at that. Yeah. Now why do you want to go? This is what I, we ask ourselves. And I believe it's because there's something in us that makes us explore. And if we don't go exploring, if we don't look up and out, what does that say about us? We're just going to stay home? We don't care? Those people, our ancestors who felt that way, are not here anymore. <laughs> My concern is we're at another crosswords where you, everybody here is ready to go to Mars, but the funding for it is not being maintained unless, um, unless we vote for it. So everybody, keep it in mind. Keep it in mind. Uh, when you interact with your representatives and stuff, that planetary exploration is a tremendous value to all of us. So I very much right now like to open it up to questions uh, from the audience. Stand up, Harry. Let them uh, turn around. That's, let me say a fabulous choice in ties. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, do you think that by setting Mars we can uh, prevent, uh, you said Mars was Earth-like, do you think that we could prevent Earth from becoming Mars-like uh, by studying Mars, or do you think that the Earth in a few billion years will be Mars-like? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And, and that's one of the reasons, actually, that, that I study planetary science. I actually got into planetary science through environmental science. 
And I think the question is, what is it that sustains a habitable environment through time? So we talk about sustainability and the environmental movement, but we can really think about sustainability and sustaining the ability to have life for four billions of years. And so I think by studying Mars and other terrestrial planets, is we, we take steps toward figuring out how planets work. We have, we have one data point here on Earth to test our physics and our chemistry-based models for how planets work. And so when we look at Mars, when we look at Venus, we have another data point for trying out our models, testing how they work. So the, our concern uh, my concern, I don't know about ours, hmm. is not becoming like Mars in a couple billion years, which is, would be an issue perhaps, but we don't want to become like Venus <laughs> in the next 20 or 50 or 100 years. And uh, it was through, discover, uh, through studying Venus uh, and the atmospheric Venus, which started 50 years ago, uh, that people discovered the role of carbon dioxide in uh, greenhouse gases and uh, climate change. And so we wouldn't have this insight. We wouldn't know this so much about our place in space, our place in the cosmos without studying these things. You know, Carl Sagan often speculated, uh, he, he wondered uh, how many stars have planets. He wondered if it was a rare thing. And I remember him in class speculating that it was one in 10. One in 10 stars have planets. Well, now it's more like 100% of stars have planets. And that's another discovery made in our lifetime. And I am so excited for you because the discoveries that will be made will change the world. Yeah, so over here. There's been some discussion in the past about a lot of the elements that we have here on Earth are results of distant stellar explosions and all of this matter somehow got to Earth. I think it's mind numbing to figure out that uh, where, how this process happened, and then how did it aggregate here on Earth, and then how would that work maybe as a building block? If you are not troubled by that, <laughs> you are somebody else. No, this is what is so compelling. This is what Carl Sagan used to talk about all the time, is we are made of star stuff. Then we are, by reasoning, we are one way at least that the universe knows itself. And right here, I think we cue the spooky music. Right here. <laughs> no, it is stunning. And so uh, as the more we learn about astronomy, the more we learn about our place in the cosmos, our place in space, the more humbling it is, I think, but also the more empowering it is that you can come to understand all that is really, it's, it's really, it's the, brings out the best in us. It's what makes our species worthy of being in the cosmos. And I, I think it's wonderful. Uh, next question's over here, yeah, in the back row. My question is, uh, I picked up my wife from work the other day and I was driving her home, our home, us home, and uh, <laughs> I was explaining to her that I was coming here and explained to her about the uh, spacecraft that is going to Pluto and will be there in 2015, I believe you said. And she asked me, why are we going to Pluto? As if, why bother? <laughs> And so I pulled over the car and asked her to get out. <laughs> I was going to say, are you you're still and, married? Uh, you're still married? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're still married. We worked it out. It's okay. And uh, so my question is, if you had 30 seconds, like an elevator pitch for space exploration, the importance of it, what it could lead to, just like you said, we're at a crossroads. We need to vote for the budget for space exploration. What is your 30 second elevator pitch to a politician and everyday Joe Schmo like myself on the street of why space exploration is important to everybody, as us as a species? It's part of our human DNA to explore, as we were talking about earlier. And uh, you know, in terms of, of, the, of the federal government budget, it, it is right and proper that we spend a substantial portion of our budget on, on defense, on infrastructure, on health, and on all those things that are important to people's day-to-day -day life. But I think to sort of maintain ourselves, our humanity, our society, and to push that, to push the boundaries, to push it outward. I mean, Kennedy said, we do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And, in, and by doing hard things, by taking not all of the budget, but a small portion, and investing it in doing something hard, 
we learn, you know, we develop new technologies, we, have, we educate the neck and inspire the next generation, and we learn something about ourselves. So I think it's important to keep that percentage because that's what, what keeps us as a society pushing forward. Um, on the political side, NASA is the top of the innovation food chain. Uh, I run a lab at, at, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I have subcontracts with companies in Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Connecticut, California, et cetera, throughout the country. And the return on investment has been shown to be greater than $2 for every $1 invested in terms of, of sort of the, the, what the US gets for its, for its taxpayer investment. So uh, feeding that innovation food chain, I think, is very important. Uh, one specific example, I, I went to grad school at Stanford. A few years before me, there was this guy who was on, he was funded through a NASA fellowship, doing something with computer knowledge, et cetera, and, and autonomy and whatever. Um, and uh, he then dropped out of, of grad school to start a company called Google. Uh, <laughs> so Sergey Brin was on a, Nash, uh, was on a NASA fellowship uh, during his time at Stanford. How do you, how do you quantify that? Now, what's the value to the taxpayer of a company like Google? That's the political. The passionate, I would simply say or ask to your wife, do you believe in the pursuit of new knowledge? Because that is at the heart of, of what NASA is about, the pursuit of new knowledge. The, the spin-offs, all that stuff, that is, that's fantastic. Obviously, that is useful. But at the heart, NASA is not just the, the, the agency for the pursuit of new knowledge for the US. NASA provides a, a cortex for our planet. For just a small amount of money, we have put spacecraft around our planet to, to let us learn about the, the habitability, the development, the changes that are occurring here on Earth, and to inform us about other planets in our solar system and how our world came to be. I value that sort of planetary cortex that, that NASA has allowed us to put in place. And so for the cup of, cof uh, the cup of coffee per year per taxpayer, uh, I'll buy two cups. <laughs> the other thing, when you travel to other parts of the world, NASA is the best branding that the United States can have. I mean, people respect what you do in a way that they they don't respect a lot of other things that the United States does. And this is such a value. I, uh, well, we're, it's such a, a, a remarkable value. So next time you talk to your wife, just remind her that she's getting a lot for her money. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if, you, if we don't keep looking up and out, we're, we're not going to move forward. Thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs>